Uh, I'm going to invite the faculty, uh, the expert faculty for this session. Uh, General Nuri Saab, if he's here, uh, can you please join us? He's on Zoom. Uh, Professor Afizullah Saab, Zoom. Mujibur Haq Saab, Zoom. Javed Sial Saab, I saw him. Ah, can you please come on stage? Uh, Javed Ahmed Saab is on Zoom. Uh, Arjuman Hashmi Saab, Akhtar Bandesha Saab. Who be the. Dr. Ambar Ashraf, please join us on the stage, or Noman, Dr. Noman, please join us. The first talk is going to be uh, by Professor Tanvir Rab. Um, do we have... Comment. This? <laughs> Can we see him? Professor Tanvir Rab is a professor of medicine and international cardiology at Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia. So he's going to talk on, uh, I think, left main PCI. He was on. Uh, I think they're getting it. So, so I cannot hear you guys very well, but assalamu alaikum. And thank you so much, Bashi, for an outstanding program uh, of, of real sophistication that you put up. It's really great to see a lot of old friends and colleagues from Pakistan. So without much ado, I'll start off my talk right now. I'll go ahead and share my screen. So, uh, can you all hear me at your end? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So, I'm going to start my slideshow now. So, let's go back. So, the topic given to me is optimizing left main PCI. I'm a professor at Emory University in Atlanta and uh, uh, I'm in the interventional cardiology. I also sit on the guidelines committee of the ACCHA and also in the publishing group for uh, ACC and also the ABI and exam committee. So, so the so teaching points for this presentation are an algorithmic approach to left main stenting, uh, talk about stepwise provisional stenting, what is new in pot, uh, proximal stent optimization of PSO and DK crush, the techniques of DK culotte imaging and DAP duration. So did the EBC main really change our approach for left main, for true left main bifurcations? And the answer is probably did not, because if you notice that EBC main in one year, findings were neutral, and did not need statistical value for either stepwise provisional or systemic dual stenting. Uh, systemic stepwise in brown and, and, and the mauve color is dual stenting. And the conclusion was single stenting is not penalized compared to the upfront two stent techniques. On the other hand, in DK crush, where uh, the complex left main bifurcation was, uh, was, uh, uh, was divided between DK crush technique and provisional, clearly the target lesion failure was worse for the provisional approach versus the DK crush technique. So did it change the algorithm that we published in 2017? No, it did not. So if you look at the approach to left main bifurcation, you have to divide it in simple lesions and complex lesions. Simple lesion is a lesion where the side branch has stenosis less than 70% and or lesion length greater less than 10 millimeters, where the complex lesion is side branch lesion equal to a greater than 70% or lesion is length greater than 10 millimeters. The other factors that make or increase lesion complexity but if you have a simple lesion with easy side branch access, and this is mostly the European approach, you think about provisional or inverted provisional, and generally a one stent technique, and that does well for the majority of cases, about 75 of the cases or so. If the side branch compromise with the FFR uh, less than or equal to 0 0.80, or there's less than TM3 flow, we can go to two stent T or TAP technique or CULOT technique. If, this, if the uh, side branch approach is not easy, for example, you can start with the side branch for this two stent technique with pull out being the European approach. On the other hand, the complex lesions, intentional two stent technique should be used. And you know, universally, the DK crush is really caught on as a technique of choice. Most importantly, and I'll keep on insisting about this, you cannot do these procedures appropriately without appropriate imaging, either the IVUS or OCT catheter. And this is strongly recommended after left main stenting. So how do you divide simple or complex lesions? Use the same definitions of uh, stenosis and lesion length, but you add other criteria from the definition criteria, including moderate to severe calcification, multiple lesions, bifurcation angle less than 45 degrees, main vessel, reference vessel diameter less than 2.5 millimeter, thrombus containing lesions, and the vessel being small in caliber or long in length at 25 millimeters. And the lesion classification approaches left wing PCI are always determined by your side branch. So technique key elements are always, you must, and the uh, EBC group 
uh, uh, really uh, uh, made it very clear that both the LED and left circumference must be wired. The stent is always sized to the distal reference vessel during the LED. Pot is essential and imaging in all cases for stent optimization. Why pot? So pot the approximate optimization technique is acquisition of the main vessel stent when the stent is sized to segment or main branch beyond the side branch. In pot after stenting, the distal balloon marker tip is always at the carina. This opens the stent cells, covers the side branch ostium, allows easy distal cell wiring of side branch, and restores the fractal geometry and reduces the stent uh, uh, thrombosis. If there's kissing balloon inflation, there's electrical deformation of the main vessel stent, and this requires always a correction for the final pot. So how do you do a pot? Uh, so you've got the stent size to say the LED, you've got space left in the main vessel, the left main, there's always a space in the stent and the vessel wall. You take balloon size to the main vessel and put the tip marker right to the crime. And so what you do is this abluminal space that you have, you need to close it off with the stent. This is what it should look like. So the EBC also emphasized the position of correct pulse. Perfect balloon position is immediately proximal to the carina and reaching the proximal stent edge. You go too distally, then there's a distal vessel overstretch and the carina is shifted and the, the vessel is pinched. If you go too proximally, you can cause vessel dissection and you have an incomplete expansion at this side branch. More recently, uh, Anderson and uh, colleagues uh, published this paper of final pot balloon position after stenting, after the after uh, two vessel stenting, or even after stenting uh, the vessel, if you do a kissing balloon inflation, if you have to do a final pot, not the first pot after stenting, but the final pot. So where should the balloon be positioned? If the balloon goes across the carina, you know, there's already metal sitting there. You, 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 you dilate this up and basically you, you narrow the space again and you pinch the side branch. And you can see that over here, by this method, the side branch orifice is reduced. If you do it proximally, uh, before the side branch, you can still preserve uh, the, the adequacy of the outflow into the side branch with very little metal protruding from into the side branch. So now the final part should be a little away from the carina, not impinging the side branch. And if you do go across the side branch, with a 43% reduction in the orifice of the side branch versus only 4% reduction if the final part is just before the side branch. These, these are important points you should know about. So let me talk about the complex procedure first, the double kiss crush stenting, and this is for the intentional two stent technique and complex left embarkation lesion, DK crush is a popular choice. And again, in the European uh, guidelines from 2018 ESC, in true bifurcation lesion of the left main, the double kissing crush technique may be preferred over provisional T stenting, the two B indication with the level of evidence being B. So again, going back to the algorithm, if you have a complex lesion as I defined, the two stent technique is the uh, is the consensus of choice, pretty in in Asia and 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 uh, and, and, and the other even in the United States right now. So this is always for two stents should be thought about upfront for complex lesion. So this is a case of mine recently, female age 56, status post cardiac arrest with anterior STEMI and cardiogenic shock. I won't go into other details, but this is what the anatomy looked like. You can see this diffuse left main narrowing. You really can't see the LED very well. Uh, it's a long lesion. You always worry about SCAD. And here's a, a long lesion in the circumflex, more than 10 millimeters in length. So clearly, it's a complex left main lesion that requires at least a two stent approach. So, in this period of case, the patient was in shock. We put the impella in, we put two wires, we run two wires in the circ and the LAD, and uh, we did serial balloon inflation in the vessel, proximal to distal. And we found with IVAS, there's no SCAD. We always think about women with long lesions of having SCAD. The left main MLA was at least 2.7 millimeters square, with significant plaque burden in the left main, proximal and mid LAD. And this was what the left main looked like, 2.8 millimeters square on, a, on IVIS. Sorry, so we did balloon inflation, from, you know, distal to proximal, and opened up the vessel, and this, looked, uh, this is what it looked like after just balloon dilatations. We stented the uh, mid LAD and also the proximal LAD, but did not cover the LAD ostium. So then we started the DK crush technique, which was positioning stent no, no, no. circumflex back to the left main. This is a 3.5 by 18 drug moving stent, the left circumflex. And then we did a PSO, pro proximal stent optimization. And the usual DK crush conventional, you basically just crush the stents over here that protruded into the left main with a balloon. What is recommended now that before this step, you and Lavara published this was bring the uh, stent delivery balloon out 
and dilated high pressures to sort of open up all these all these all these cells at the orifice of the side branch. So if we don't do that. If you do the conventional crush, this is what the side branch orifice looks like. If you expand it with PSO technique, you have a larger orifice area. After this, what you need to do is balloon crush. You take a 3.5 by 12 NC balloon in this case, and we crushed it. How the crush is incomplete? There's still a gap in between the between the cells, as you can see over here, in the, in the left main. So you need to crush this completely. And then we took a larger balloon. We took a 4 by 12 balloon to complete uh, uh, crush the side branch stent struts are protruding out to minimize the gap. After that, we did a proximal rewiring. How do you know that the wire goes away from the carina or more towards the uh, proximal cells, you know you're crossing proximally. Obviously, you have uh, IBUS or OCT that can confirm that, but generally, if you go away from the carina, you're proximal, and what you need to do is make sure the jail wire serves as a marker for you. So in DK crush, it's always proximal recross, not like distal recross in the provision approach. It's always proximal. Then you do a kissing balloon inflation. You take two short 3 patrol non-compliant balloons. Remember, wrong kissing techniques, too far proximally, does not do a good kiss, too far distally, there's, there's, there's malapposition with, with both these techniques. So you've got to have perfect short balloons, perfect apposition in, this, in the two branches to, to crush the, to do the first kissing balloon inflation. After that, we put a 3.5 by 22 drug room stent from the, that uh, other stent approximately back to the left main. And did, we did a part with a uh, 3.75 non-combined balloon. Look at the balloon tip marker right at the carina. Sorry, Following this, we did rewiring one. again from the proximal cell. And we did alternate inflations uh, with high pressures at, the, at the, both the circumflex and the and left main to the LED to 16 atmospheres. Then we did a uh, we did a larger balloon from the LED to the left main and a trio balloon in the circumflex. Did, did final kissing inflations and then we did final part with four non-compliant balloon. And you know from the LED to left main, this is what the iris looks like. Uh, you have pretty good expansion of your cells, and also you can look from the left circle to the left main. You've got pretty good expansion and apposition of these of the of the stent struts. So this is the final result in this case, in patient of cardiogenic shock. Left main MS uh, stent area is 12.6, and the LED of the ostium was 6.6. This is the final result in this case, and the patient did well. So the steps again, once again, you have a short protrusion of the side branch stent. You should do proximal stent optimization, balloon crush with large balloon, rewire from the proximal uh, cell, alternate inflation 16 atmospheres before first kissing, stenting main vessel back to the left main, first part, rewire from the proximal cell, alternative inflation, second kissing, and final part. So you always use short overlapping of two balloons kissing balloon inflations. Uh, Bashir, how much time do you have left uh, now? Uh, we are out of time actually. So, Sorry? Uh, we are out of time actually. We are already okay. over time. Yes. Let's talk about DK coulotte. So, the uh, traditional DK uh, coulotte was stent coming from the side branch into the main vessel. And then basically, you put another stent after you recross. And after you put the stent, uh, 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 you dilate the, sorry, you dilate the stent strut sticking out into the main vessel or the left main. And then you put a stent across these cells. And then you just do a pot on the, on the, on the, on the stent in the, in the left main. And then you do a re, then you do a rewiring of the side branch and do the only kissing balloon inflation. And you do a final part, and this is the result of the usual pull out technique. The problem with that was there was stent distortion at the origin of the side branch and and, and the, uh, the classic pull out technique. And so DK pull out came across as, as a two kiss technique or double kiss technique. Again, stent from the side branch to the main vessel. And then you rewire and you, you dilate the stent struts. After rewiring, you do the first kissing balloon inflation. So this was new for coulotte, okay? And after that, you put the stent across, the left main straight to the LED, you do the first part, rewire again, do the second kissing balloon inflation, do a final part, and this is your result for the coulotte technique. With this technique, the coulotte stent distortion as your origin of the side branch can be corrected with the first kissing balloon inflation. Let's go to uh, the provisional cases. 75% of cases are treated with one stent or provisional stenting a stepwise approach. So in our publication, what we showed was, that again, we wire both vessels, the LED and the circumflex, the size of the stent to the LED back to the left main. And after you, you after that, you do the first part, and generally you could be done if, and, and pretty good the side branches free of disease. However, if you have any concerns of side branch, 
you then uh, do a wire exchange in the LED and left circumflex or put a fresh wire. But in this case, you buy the distal cell, okay? Distal cell, just this distal wire recross. Then you do a kissing balloon inflation, always end up with a pot. In this case, this is an older diagram. This uh, tip of the balloon mark should pull back a little bit into, into, into the proximal to the side branch, uh, just for the reasons I explained to you from the study by Anderson. And this should be final result. Kissing balloon inflation has higher risk to nosis rates. So pot side pot or pot side repot is another strategy. Again, you do the same steps, two, two wires, stent, pot, and after, and after that, what you do is rewire, and after rewiring, then you come up with a small balloon to protrude to this to this to this struts of side branch, and then followed by, by a final pot or repot. So this pot side repot, which has more favorable outcomes than kissing balloon technique. But let me show you a few cases. Uh, provisional stenting, see this uh, uh, stenosis, some uh, stenosis of circumflex, which uh, uh, by subsequent pressure wire was not relevant. We did eyeless in this patient, we wired both vessels, we dilated the, uh, this, the, uh, the, the vessel, and then we positioned a uh, Sorry, 4 over 16 DS. Uh, we are out of time, actually. Uh, we are actually and then uh, five we minutes did a stent deployment already. and did a pot with a 5 over by 8 NC balloon. And this is the final result. Uh, perfect. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I wish we had more time. Bashir, I can't hear anyone from the panel. Please text me, let me know if my, uh, my time is... Sarve, we are out of time. Okay, all right. So I'll end here, okay? Uh, and uh, just, to, just to tell you one other thing, the value of imaging, it's very important that that uh, that 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 imaging is, is done in all cases, uh, and uh, otherwise there's highest rate of uh, definite or probable stent thrombosis if imaging guiding is not used. And the more current criteria are distal left main confluence of 10 millimeters square, LED ostium 7 millimeters square, and uh, 6 millimeter the circumflex ostium. And I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so I think we are out of time for questions. So we're going to go straight to the next talk. It's uh, Professor Ramesh Dugavati from uh, West Virginia University. He's a professor of medicine, associate uh, chief of cardiology, and director of structural heart. He's also member board of trustees for Sky and chair of Sky International Committee. Uh, so Professor uh, Dugavati, please. In the meantime, mm. I think until Dr. Ramesh comes on, if there's any quick question from Dr. Rob, we can. Well, uh, yeah. Well, just can I just make a comment if you're sure. waiting? Go ahead. Uh, this is about the imaging in uh, left main. Now, initially when we started left main at NICVD, used to, I used to image all of that. Uh, uh, every single case in the left main was imaged. Uh, then we found out that our uh, post stent for optimization, as you mentioned, there was hardly any difference uh, that we made any difference to our procedure because we already got used to it. I think the imaging issue with the cost that we have um, the only thing is if there's a complication or if there is a doubt about something about uh, plaque or sizing or dissection versus uh, some other hematomas and things, that is where imaging must come in in this term. But for just for post-stent optimization, we always do it with 4 or 4.5, now we got used to it. So I think just for that purpose, uh, an extra cost of 70, 80,000 rupees, <coughs> probably in the Pakistani perspective, is not worth in with experienced operators, the ones who've used divers and have got used to it and now know uh, that w once they've deployed the stent and geographically what it should be and they use their correct size. Thank you. Uh, Professor Nasi? You uh, I think Rapsap can uh, comment more on it, but now there's some outcomes data as well supporting the use of imaging, especially for left mains. Guidelines give it a 2A, but uh, to, you know, should, but um, unless cost is really a constraint, uh, should try to use it as much as we can. I had a question from uh, Dr. Rabbi. He showed the slide of three options in provisional stenting, how to deal with the side branch. Which option do you normally use? I mean, I stick to option one most of the time. It's always a debate whether to balloon the side branch or not, or whether to do the kiss of the side branch, but uh, I just leave it if it looks good uh, in the provisional approach from left man to LED. What is generally your approach in most cases? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. I, I'm having a hard time hearing from the panelists and speaker. I just uh, can't hear you. I'm sorry. I think uh, he wanted to know that uh, with the provisional stenting, 
which approach you use, like one, two, or three in your practice? I just prefer one stent approach, Bashir. I mean, I, if there's very little disease side branch, usually just one stent approach. And I don't usually uh, do a kissing balloon inflation. And if anything, if I'm worried about the opening to the circumflex, I do a pot uh, side repot. Okay. What do you, uh, did you hear um, uh, Dr. Rizvi's question? He was talking, no, I did not. Yeah, he was saying that obviously in our setup, it is very difficult to do routine IVAS, especially in left main and in experienced experts, uh, they can do without it as well. So what is your comments on that? Is it really? You know, I don't work? think left main should be done without IVAS because you'll see very under, very under expanded stents. You may think the vessel is like a 4.5, but it may actually be a 5. And the risk of stent thrombosis in the left main is really due to underexpanded, uh, non-opposed stents. So I, I'm, you know, I don't think a left main procedure per se should be done without 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 any kind of imaging, uh, because the risk of the stent thrombosis from underexpanded left main is very very high, and you can't afford to have uh, stent thrombosis in the left main. And you know, I mean, left main is is PCI, particularly a single stent approach. It's a very good technique for, for, uh, for PCI procedures. And, but if you have to have the optimum result, uh, you have to have the optimum result for that, okay? And without a good yeah, optimum yeah, result, yeah, yeah, right. not helpful. I'm, I'm so sorry, I can't hear any of your questions. It's okay, we are ready, unfortunately, for the, for the next case. Dr. Ramesh uh, is, uh, Dr. Ramesh, can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear, okay, and so I think uh, there's somebody who's speaking probably, that's why. Okay, please go But ahead. I can hear you, sir. You please okay, thank go you. ahead with your talk. Okay. The panelists cannot, I cannot hear the panelists. And they're saying to, for me to go ahead with my talk and probably oh. we'll have discussion at the end. Okay, go ahead. Perfect. Thanks. Ramesh, you have 12 minutes, please. Okay, I'll try to make it in 10 minutes if it's okay. Yes, thank you. And let me just, uh, so this is, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bashir, Nadeem, and uh, all my good friends from Pakistan, and I wish we, I was there uh, in person, but uh, let's go ahead and talk about rotational atherectomy, case selection, and technique. No relevant con in, uh, conflicts. So the strategy for approaching calcified lesions is actually to be able to deliver a stent and uh, expand it quite well as a uh, we have heard in this morning's meetings as well as the conveyor to make sure that imaging is used. So if you cannot cross a, uh, with a balloon, then you start thinking about atherectomy. That is called, in my opinion, balloon test. If not, if there is angiographic moderate or severe calcification, you can try to see with IVUS if there is severe calcium, do atherectomy and angiographic severe calcification, go for atherectomy strategies directly. This is a much better uh, uh, algorithm. You look at the uh, balloon crossability. As I said, uh, if there is nothing, go with uh, rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy. And I think a direct wiring is also possible. And then if, uh, if you cannot even cross with microcatheter, wire it uh, directly, go for rotational atherectomy or sometimes laser and optimal balloon expansion. Whereas if you cannot, uh, if you can cross the um, balloon, you pre-dilate, do an intravascular ultrasound if or a OCT. If the calcium is more than 180 degree arc and the length is more than 5 millimeters of calcium and the thickness of the calcium is more than 0.5 millimeters, uh, then uh, look for uh, either cutting balloon or non-compliant balloon uh, if these features are not met. If these features, the three features are met, and uh, look for deep calcium or superficial calcium. If it is deep calcium, go with the shock wave uh, or a uh, lithotripsy. And if not, you can go with the rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy. And obviously, optimal balloon expansion has to be performed in all these patients. And uh, so, uh, rotor is uh, coming up much uh, better, but uh, we still, in the United States, the overall use of uh, any type of atherectomy device is only two to three percent. People are worried about complications, and uh, that is the reason that actually everybody shies away from doing a, a proper uh, bed preparation of these calcified vessels. And now with shockwave, probably people will use it more often. 
But as my talk is only about the rotational atherectomy, I'll stick to that. And how do you select patients? I think I would encourage everyone to start using in these least difficult type of lesions where the calcium is less than 10 millimeters in length, minimal calcifications or moderate calcifications, straightforward vessels uh, in people who have ejection fraction uh, 50% and above and good distal runoff. And uh, you know, even if it is a resynotic lesion, you know, sometimes uh, if the balloons no restenotic lesion, you can do it. If it is a, uh, a stent restenosis, uh, please uh, be careful. Don't use a, uh, a, a rota in the, that patient in your first uh, few uh, cases. The more difficult lesion, this is for, I think, if you have done about, uh, I would say, maybe 10 rotors in, the, in such a uh, least difficult lesion, then you can come. Uh, more uh, difficult lesion that is 10 millimeters or longer, mild tortuosity, tapering vessels, eccentricity, and LV function uh, less than 50%. The most uh, difficult is a long, heavily calcified, significantly tapered distal vessels, eccentric uh, lesions, and a reduced LV function. Some of these patients will need uh, uh, balloon pumps or impella, depending upon the availability. And these are highly complex and should be done only in a trained, uh, by trained uh, physicians. So then coming to the technique, and, uh, and I'll show you a few cases later. The bud selection for uh, uh, rota, uh, it is, uh, you can look at it at the, uh, how do you determine the largest final bud size? The 0.60 to 0.85 final bud to artery ratio. So if you think it's a 2-0 vessel, start off with 1-5. All we need to make is a room to make the uh, stent go in. So if it is a large left main, like four row vessel, maybe two to five is a bar that you can choose. Because the more, uh, if you cross this 0.85, the risk of uh, perforation are much higher. The minor uh, bar may be used to begin treatment. Sometimes I start with 1.25 1, 1 as well. If there is no balloon or no microcatheter is crossing, that's when I choose 1.25. Otherwise, most of the time it is 1.5. And then I go ahead with uh, either a, a balloon or a, a non-compliant balloon or cutting balloon. Or even sometimes last week I did a shockwave balloon after rotor. The smaller burr should be selected on tortuosity, eccentricity, angulations more than 60 degrees. If there is a guide wire bias and excessive plaque burden and a slow flow chest pain. ECG changes and hemodynamic compromise. So there is nothing wrong in choosing a small burr to start off with. The problem with you choosing a large burr at times is that you might cross one time and you might stall completely and you might get stuck. How about guide catheter selections? I think the inner guide di guiding diameter, at least the largest burr, plus 0.1 millimeters. So you have to go up. And uh, side holes are recommended by some people. I don't like side holes, but uh, it's up to you. And uh, so if you want a 2.5 bar, you need to go at least uh, the internal diameter has to be 2.6 millimeters. And uh, you know, so uh, if you want a 1.25 bar, you can do easily do up to uh, 1.75 with six French, uh, especially with the launcher guide catheters. But uh, after that, you need to go upsize to seven French or even if you do, do five, it is comfortable to do eight French guide catheters. So outside the body, these are the draw technique, the drip, rotate, advancer, and wire. The saline drip from bottom of advancer and catheter. Make sure the burr is rotating and RPMs are stable, not step up, sorry. And advancer, free movement of advancer knob is performed and uh, wire is visible and brake is functioning. When you advance the uh, uh, burr at the artery, make sure that it is first uh, give a short run so that it uh, jumps forward. That means you did not remove the slack in the system as uh, 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 make it more neutral. So it's okay to test actually uh, in the left main to just make sure that it jumps and then position your uh, uh, burr just uh, uh, proximal to the lesion. So. Ablating technique, the set the baseline RPM, uh, people can choose 140 to 180,000 RPM. I, I would normally start at 150 and sometimes I go to 160. Uh, the set baseline RPM proximal to the lesion, slowly advance burr while you are on the uh, 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 150,000 RPM or so, 
and adjust the per RPM. Uh, one of the nurses can be looking at it and adjusting it as need be. Avoid decelerations anything more than 3,000, but definitely more than 5,000. If it crosses a deceleration suddenly, if it falls from 150 to 140, you're going to be in trouble. It might get stuck. So please be aware of that. And intermittent pullback for coronary perfusion under contrast injection, giving nitro and making sure that you're good. Before advancing burrow wire, position the advancer knob two to three centimeters forward and lock it. And then, as I mentioned, we advance it. So there's a picture to uh, show that in a little bit. So do not over tighten your adapter, avoid the daughtering, never stop the burr in lesion, never advance the rotating burr to point of contact with guide wire spring tip. And do not allow the burr to remain in one location while rotating at high speeds. Gently advance or retract the burr while it is in high speed rotary motion. So you have to make sure that this, your hand is very stable and very uh, soft and uh, you know gently advancing it and pulling it back and a pecking motion. So here is the, uh, a nice uh, uh, demo of how it should be done. So then actually go peck, come back, peck, come back. And again, one more time peck and then you might cross through it. So this is a very nicely done and then you, sh you see that it is polishing run. So the short ablation runs of 15 to 20 seconds, avoid decelerations, definitely anything more than 3,000, but definitely more than 5,000 and using a pecking motion. And final polishing runs. Most of the people, when they show rotor, what we are showing is the final polishing runs. Don't think that everyone is performing how the final polishing run is, okay? Because in your educational meetings, this is what you see and you might think that this is how it should be done. No, sorry. So make sure in final polishing run that there are no RPM drops and no tactile resistance. Okay. So exchange then uh, for uh, the uh, wire uh, clip has to be at the tip of the, uh, the distal end of the wire towards you uh, and uh, make sure you're on Dynaglide uh, and foot pedal or the nowadays Rotor Pro on the hand uh, switch and uh, uh, activate the butter Dynaglide at 60,000 to 90,000 RPM and uh, withdraw spinning butter sheath and advance the guide wire. So I actually sometimes exchange the rotor uh, floppy wires to a regular short wire and then uh, perform all my uh, further balloon dilatation and delivering the stent as need be. So here is a 70 year old male patient with a bypass surgery, non-ST elevation and my patent grafts found to have a 99% proximal RCA which was not grafted. So as you can see, this is a little bit of an easy type of lesion. Sorry, it has proximal, heavily calcified and uh, uh, so we did a rotor here and it's an eccentric. So I think an intermediary type of a patient selection that if you want to say, but see how slowly we are performing. This is how it should be done. Okay. Ramesh, and then we minutes. balloon dilated and delivered the stent. Two and minutes. Pre and post. So this is uh, not uh, uh, yeah, somebody who in the first uh, 10 or 50 cases. They're very tortuous and LAD, very calcified as you can see. And, uh, you know, so this is a rotor and this uh, run is a polishing run. That's why I'm trying to tell you. Do not think that that's how we did. We did very slowly. It took a long time to do the 1.5 and then the 1.75 and then we were able to deliver three stents and uh, it was a, a great result. Uh, this is how the post uh, PCI to LED looked. Ramesh, we have to end. Uh, the time is over and they are ready for yes. the live case. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll, end, I'll end here. So you know, more take home message, select the patients based on imaging, get comfortable with simpler calcified lesions, prevent complications with proper technique and do not rush while doing a rotor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank for your you. Great so talk. We, uh, just, just a quick announcement. There is a uh, dinner, uh, cruise dinner at 8.30. The buses will leave from, from the hotel at 8.30. Uh, Ramesh, I, we have to move on because they are ready for the TAVI. Uh, they are waiting for us um, in the U.S. So we have to go there. Thank you very much. Thank I know you very have much to go you. to the cath lab. Uh, thanks a lot for sparing time and um, I don't know if, if you will be able to stay or not. If you have to go, that's fine. Thanks. Okay, so we will go stay to... as long as I can. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dukapati. So we're going to go to South Oklahoma Howard uh, with Dr. Naeem Tahir Khali. He's the senior medical director of Oklahoma Heart Hospital. 
uh, South Campus and the Medical Director of South Oklahoma Heart Research. So, Dr. Uh, Tyre Kelly, please. Can we see him on this? Okay. Well, uh, so um, this is uh, Dr. Vark, and Dr. Bruce Cannon is uh, are helping me. Um, and uh, uh, we're just going to show you a tower case, and then I'll uh, show you our hybrid room, our staff, and then um, uh, we'll go from there. Um, and we actually have a left main rotavator case also going on in the other lab, and I'm going to try to show both of you, uh, both of those cases, within about uh, 60 minutes or less. Um, so this is the patient. Um, this um, Bashir asked me to um, get a straightforward TAVR case, so this is what it is. It's a low-risk um, um, TAVR adverts that we're going to do, a 62-year-old lady, fairly obese, a lot of smoking, um, mild COPD, non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Labs are pretty good. Um, this is the echo. So whenever we do TAVR, these uh, PowerPoints are made beforehand and then uh, on the day, uh, myself or uh, whoever else is uh, the interventional cardiologist and, and CT surgeon, um, uh, which is Bruce Cannon in this uh, case, review all these. Uh, um, so, um, and then you can see uh, right there um, is the aortic valve. Um, these are the TE measurements, so all of them, all these patients will get TEs, um, and so we look at the measurements from there, and the sinuses are three, annulus is about two. Um, this is the cat pictures, non-obstructive coronary artery disease, like I said, and so these are the uh, CTA workups. Um, so here is the valve, and uh, the, the measurement is 26 by 20, and those are the uh, minimum maximum diameters. In the, Perimeter is 74.5, and I'll show you that a little bit more. So this is the annulus, uh, which is quite a bit uh, decent size, 28, 28, 27. Um, and um, 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 we're looking at also at the coronary heights. I'll show you that here in a second. Um, but basically, um, you can see uh, this is the left. And so, and then here's the right, and so 12 and 15 millimeters. This is looking at the CTA and the calcification and the size of the artery. So you can see the bilateral common leg artery is pretty decent, 9.7 and 11 millimeter in um, size, um, both sides. Um, there is further down, um, and then um, this is, so we do all of that work up, and then we have the company that's Edwards will do the whole workup again. And again, this is at the 30% uh, phase uh, of systole, and that's what it's looking at. And I'm just going to rush through this. It is a better uh, rendition of uh, the height of coronary. So the Edwards measured this to be 17, which is right, and 13, which is uh, left. Um, and then this is a 3D rendition, and we're looking at it. There's one area on the right side we're all concerned about. Um, we're measuring anywhere from four and a half to five and a half. Uh, but I think the rest of the area is good, so we are going to go from the right. Um, and so this is the sizing chart. So what I would have you uh, notice is that annular area is 412 by Edwards, and we measured it 417, 23 millimeter here. Can you follow me, or am I going really fast? No, no, we're good. We're good. We can follow you. Uh, this is 23 millimeters, so the range for that is 338 to 430. Um, so the nominal is 406. So the, the valve is slightly undersized compared to the annual area. So we're planning on putting in about one cc of uh, contrast extra. So that's the patient. I will just run through our hybrid lab um, because really the whole thing is set up by our support staff and we just um, come and uh, do probably the more simple work, the more complex work is done by all these guys. So um, if you just go around, um, you switch it over to me. Okay. All right, so Megan, our uh, valve coordinator. Megan, Erica, my nurse practitioner. Is that Dustin, our radiology manager? Our research staff in the back. Um, Jenny, my uh, nurse practitioner, Brian. Uh, Brittany, um, IT nurse. Um, so this is our uh, control room. And uh, 
This is the hybrid room. In the back is the anesthesia nurses and support staff. Um, this is Andrea, who's uh, the echo person. So this is a conscious sedation patient. We'll be doing um, transthoracic echo at the end. Up there is Dr. Jimmy Kwan. Dr. Kwan, would you? Great. There you go. <laughs> and then Dr. Bruce Cannon. He's the biggest guy in here. Um, he's our cardiothoracic surgeon who's scrubbed in. Um, uh, Carissa. Carissa is uh, from Edwards. She's the uh, regional manager. She came in here especially. Alyssa is our scrub tech. She's been with us 15 years. I told her to come and scrub this way so that if we make any mistakes, she can help us with this. Uh, Bree is another one of our scrub techs. She's surgical. Dr. Park um, is uh, my colleague. He's a graduate of KE from 1997, uh, trained at Michigan State. He's done all the case, um, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to him, and then I'll scrub it and come in the room. So uh, up to you, Dr. Ward. So, uh, Dr. Ty Kelly, just a question. So what's your plan? Like, there is not much calcium on those leaflets. So are you going to go uh, straight with the st uh, valve itself, or are you planning to do something else before that? I had a hard time hearing you. Can you speak a little louder, please? Yes. Uh, so uh, this is Dr. Asad Khan here. So my question was, there's not much uh, calcium on those leaflets. Are you planning to balloon it still, or are you going to go straight with the uh, valve itself? Yeah, as you mentioned, there is not much calcium, so plan is uh, not to use any balloon valvuloplasty. We'll go with the valve directly. And uh, unless calcium is significant, we are trying to stay away from balloon valvuloplasty. Although data is limited, but uh, more time you inflate that big balloon, whether it's valvuloplasty or actual valve implantation, we always increase the risk of stroke. So in this patient, definitely we don't plan to do any Perfect. So this is the first picture we have done that uh, access on the left side. That's a standard uh, micropuncture technique. And uh, we use both uh, ultrasound and fluoroscopic guidance. So this is on the left side. We have six French uh, sheath uh, arterial and venous. On the right side, which is going to be our main side. So this is already there. So we have already put uh, our closes for hemostasis purposes towards the end. So can you show the next picture? So, the, so just showing you the picture, we try to keep the pigtail in uh, right coronary cusp and uh, look for the angle. And for this patient, it is almost LAO 16. So we are going to start the case by crossing the aortic valve. I have, so I have uh, AL1. We are going to go with the regular O3-5 wire. Um, sorry, I have one more question. Uh, like, so in Pakistan, we have started yes, adopting this cusp overlap technique uh, just because of these cost issues with pacemaker. Uh, what are your takes on that? Uh, do you use cusp overlap for right-left overlap, or you go with the traditional way? So we are still doing the traditional way. So for people who have not... Uh, are not familiar with this overlap technique. So just to mention that uh, historically we have done 80-20 or 90-10 uh, kind of uh, making sure that the 90% of the valve is hearing above the animus and 10% below. So, so we, are we are not using that. Personally, I'm not using this 2% rule. No, it's, it's uh, not for the sapien valve. So we use it so, for four so. I was just trying to get your uh, thoughts. Yeah, this is, uh, this is, this is yeah. So, so to answer, answer your question, question um, 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 Edward's about 70% of the time. Um, our uh, four values are uh, uh, smaller, smaller and endless. Well, preferably, you can go four values. And then, and then um, 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 uh, other little uh, 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 there's some background out. noise coming. We are not able to hear you. Yeah, well. yeah, after this, I'll move away from Imran. Please, that's better. Can you hear me? Is it better? Yes, we can hear you. 
is AL1 your standard catheter or do you sort of change it based on the anatomy, the angle or sinus size or something like that? So typically I'm more like a very conventionalist when it comes to I'm an AL1 and AL2 kind of guy. So if it is a non-dilated annulus, I always try with AL1 first. And if AL1 does not work, then I go with the AL2. And that rarely it happens that we have to go to JR4 or something like that. So um, I'm going to have Jay come over to this side as, as uh, he gets So we just cross the valve. So, um, yeah, after the last question, we are about 80%, 90% uh, no balloon audio um, audio? Uh, for putting stents in. And uh, can can you see us? Yes, we can see you. So, so uh, instead so, of the traditional co planner view. Uh, yeah. So, in the cusp overlap, we use it for uh, core valve. And what we do is in the, tra um, in the traditional co planner view, we align the bottom edges of all three okay. analyte can, together. Can you hear me, guys? And, uh, corny sinuses and we keep the non on the other side and what we have seen is that you, if you deploy at zero to still, one are you still getting a lot of echo and the plane you actually end up uh, slightly deeper than what you think and you avoid the pacemaker risk okay. so in the normal core valve data you have pacemaker risk anywhere from eight percent to up to 30 percent in some of the european studies and with this you can actually yeah, reduce really it by uh, to up to two percent okay Sorry, one question, Dr. Tayakeli. Is it the Sapien 3 or is it the Sapien 3 Ultra? Like, which one are we using today? Okay, let's go back to the. Uh, um, so, Dr. Tayakeli, can you hear us? Part, so. Hello. Which valve are you using? Sapien 3 or. Uh, Sapien 3 Ultra. Sapien 3 Ultra. Said probably you do the commentary. I think. Can you all still hear me? No. Yeah. yeah uh, now we can, we can hear, hear you. you. So, but what yes, we are we trying can. to figure out is which valve. Okay. Are and you the echo is gone. Thank you. Thank you. So we can okay. see a crimping. Good. So we uh, 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 what Dr. Work has done has uh, changed out that uh, straight wire for a safari wire, um, and um, so we're ready to get the valve in place. Alyssa, why don't you get the uh, can you hear us or you can't? Um, can you uh, Dr. go Asad, full camera it's primary? A, it's a confederate wire. Naeem, can you hear us? Same, it is a furry. Dr. Tari? Um, can you hear us? Camera, floral, primary. Would you like to prefer rapid pacing? Dr. Asad, what do you think? Uh, routinely, it should be, a valve should be implanted with rapid pacing, or not the sapien? No, sapien is always rapid pacing. Sapien cannot be without pacing. So in low ejection fraction so patients, we prefer core valve. That the, you can deploy at night. So the Sapien valve is 100% times uh, deployed with rapid pacing because when we're deploying the balloon va valve, it's occluding the entire blood flow and we don't want it uh, thrown out. I have a, um, a talk tomorrow, we'll show you how a valve can come out. We're pacing the patient and uh, the, because of the PVC, a valve was thrown out. I can hear you, Bashir. Yeah, we have been trying to ask you questions, but I don't know whether uh, you are not. We are just trying to ask you if it's the sapient I, field. I can hear you. I think the other people oh, have to speak oh, oh, It looks like the sapient three, so I think we're going to take that. So we're 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 using a sapient ultra valve, twenty-three millimeter. Can everybody hear me? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to see if they can hear me or not. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. 
I think uh, the ones on Zoom can hear. Yes, we can hear, but I'm not sure about the horn. We can hear it also, but okay. for somehow I think our voice is not going to them. Ah, Bashir, your volume is very low actually. Can you please uh, bring up the volumes, please? Okay, we're, we're going to go over the, the steps here. So can, can you show, uh, Jay, show this? Um, and then have that uh, uh, floral and uh, our camera side by side so we can show back and forth. Go ahead, Imran. So this is the initiation of the uh, We are losing you. I th um, can he speak a bit louder? Speak up. I can speak quite louder. Perfect. And I think so most can you, uh, on the floor, can you see those three dots coming back the into the valve? Time. That's the balloon coming back into the valve now. The reason for that is this way you can have a smaller size of the catheter and you load the balloon inside the valve, inside the body in the aorta. These steps are very Dr. Cannon, do you have any thoughts? You just have to speak up. This will, speaker will pick up here. Uh, so you have used the uh, uh, CPN3? CPN3 Ultra, so it was in its initial stages when I left New York. So the actually the sheet that they use now has been revised. Like the initial CPN3 Ultra could not be pushed through this sheet. So this is a revised sheet which does not peel off. What size sheet is now this? It's the, uh, so they claim it's 14 inches, 14 but French. once it expands. It's, uh, Bashir, it's 14 French. The true OD of that becomes 18. So the hole in the it's artery expensive. is about 18 French. Okay. Now we can hear you clearly. He can hear us. Right now we think that we are in a good position. So we're doing fluoroscopy, of course. This patient does not have fluoroscopy. So we're going to rely heavily on fluoroscopy. So we're doing this in conscious sedation. So about 70 80 percent of our patients will do it under conscious sedation. So in that case, we don't put a TE in. Uh, we'll have transthoracic echo. As soon as we uh, deploy it, we'll take a look at transthoracic and look at the images of for peritoneal or something. So in Pakistan, we only most of the time, I would say probably 99% of the time, use Avalos, uh, Medtronic valves. Uh, we don't have uh, the cost is too much to be used. If you can tell us the steps uh, in terms of positioning, we are in the right corner because we have already been aligned, so we are pretty happy with it. So, the basic one of the basic design differences between Sapien 3 and Sapien 3 Ultra is that there is only one dot instead of three that you have with Sapien 3. And if you put it in the middle, you actually end up with 80 20 because it's four shots on the LV side. So, it's go it looks like in the middle, but once it opens up, it will be 80 20. Okay, so you're going to come up a little bit. Keep that dot at the lower end of the... Lower end, huh, of the envelope plane, huh? Take another picture. So what does everybody think? Do you like it or should we come up good. a little bit? Yeah. Looks pretty good? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Dr. Kwan is going to start pacing. Then we will inject again. If we like it, then uh, we'll say to deploy and Dr. Cannon will deploy it. So Dr. Then Dr. Kwan, start pacing, please. You people use only um, this uh, Sapien uh, valves, no Evolute? Yes. Inject. Okay. Mm. Oh. Yes. Looks a bit oh. high. No. Okay. Stop 
facing. Drop facing. Good. Yeah, it was a little high. We were trying to do 90-10. So let's see how that goes. <clears throat> and just go ahead and give a little aortogram here so you can peek at it. So it's 10 for 10, 700. So our blood pressure is okay. Can you show the hemodynamics? If not, just do the other. Go ahead. We'll repeat one. We're just just for the audience. So you see it, it's pretty perfect there. Pretty good. About yeah. 90 it 10. We'll shorten a bit more on the left side, but it looks pretty good. Right? Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to do a quick um, echo. Andrea's going to do that, and we'll take a look at that. And then um, uh, Imran will finish this up, and we'll go over to the other room where we're doing the oh, uh, impella tell and left What are the order. differences between the Sapien and uh, the Evolute? Evolute. So, <laughs> Sapien is obviously balloon expandable, core valve is self expanding. Balloon, uh, Sapien is um, always like a one shot thing. You always pace, you make sure Fire you're enough. in the right plane. And there is no coming back from it once we have committed. Uh, with Corval, we have three chances. Uh, and you can go up to two-third deployment and still go back on it if you're not happy with the position. So it's pretty um, handy when you're look, uh, dealing with difficult anatomies. Another advantage of core valve is that it has supranal leaflets. So you prefer those in valve in valve cases because you don't want all the leaflets of the a uh, new valve and the previous valve aligning in the same plane because that would mean a uh, smaller actual uh, orifice that you will get at the end of the case. Uh, so uh, those are a few of the cases. And then in probably high-risk uh, patients who have a reduced EF, probably you would prefer core valve. Again, in cases where you combine, where you have combined AR, uh, m more than moderate AR with uh, mild aortic stenosis and stuff like that, there you would prefer a core valve again. And then Sapien is amazing for preserving cornea anatomy. Somebody who has complex cornea artery disease, you would prefer a Sapien over core valve because you have a wire access. You can uh, get access to the coronary just like a normal uh, patient who, won't, who doesn't have a tower valve. So we're looking at the echo images and stuff. Yeah, so I, I said I agree with you. I uh, just uh, listening to you, I can I I can I I I can hear that you have a little preference for four valve, um, and that that is uh, certainly uh, uh, completely understandable. So we were part of original partner trials and Sertavi trials, and um, and um, uh, me and Dr. Kalagani. Unfortunately, he, he had to go to Rhode Island today, so he couldn't be here. And Dr. Chohan is another one who does with us. So we're four Pakistanis who do this here. And um, then there's Dr. John Williams, five of us out of the 50 interventional cardiologists that we have at the Oklahoma Heart Hospital. Um, so, but, but uh, um, the, the, the thing about core valve, though, is what you just pointed out, which is very important, is the coronary anatomy. Mm. So as we go to the low risk population or intermediate risk population, um, the access to coronaries after the valve uh, is a very big issue. Yeah. In regards to longevity, I think they're both equally good. Um, and and uh, uh, Asad's point is very well taken. Those patients who have a larger amount of aortic regurgitation and mild aortic stenosis, I, uh, a core valve would be better because it's a nitinol uh, brain and it continues to expand and will, will hold much better. Um, but for most everything else, I think I personally prefer um, and um, um, this looks like a very uh, good result. Do you take your pigtail out usually, or is it just because we did it in one shot that uh, you left it there? Take the pigtail out. Uh, at, yeah, uh, no, we generally leave it in. It doesn't. Yeah, no, no, we just generally leave it in. Uh, it never had, you know, we started yeah. off when there was only 20, 30 um, um, towers put in at that time. So we've never really had to worry about it. Usually, um, it comes out pretty easily. Perfect. So, um, any other questions for Taver? I'm going to go over to the other room. Dr. Um, uh, Vark is going to finish up here. Um, the other thing about... Um, yes, I, um, have, I have a question. Uh, 
what is your experience of dealing with hard blocks after deploying this well? Is it more common well, than think, a core well or I think, less common? Yeah, I think you've, you've led into the, the, the discussion that uh, uh, we were not talking about, but um, core valve has a much higher risk of uh, pacemakers than, uh, than, um, uh, than Edwards. The yes. new Evolute Pro, and especially learning to deploy it much higher, has decreased the incidence, but unfortunately in our, in our hands is still the core valve has a higher chance of uh, developing heart blocks. Um, and, uh, and there's been some, several trials that have looked at it, um, and some um, from Europe, there have been some uh, <clears throat> uh, real world data that unfortunately shows that there's a much higher percentage. Yeah, it was in the uh, initially when we started, it was almost 25%. It's down to about 15% now. Uh, with Corval, uh, with uh, with Edwards, we actually in our own data, uh, we have like five percent to eight uh, percent uh, risk. And that too, most of them are ones that have right bundle to start with. So obviously, when you have right bundle and you go to the left side and you bump the left uh, bundle branch, you get a higher chance of having a heart block. Um, so. Um, so the work will continue. I'm going to run over to the you next room. Go to show us the other case. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that was an excellent result. So this is good. So you have done both. Which, which one do you think is easier in terms of? Sapien uh, is much quicker, easier, and then uh, you decide regarding the pacemaker there and then. Uh, if patient goes into heart lock, you can discuss pacemaker whether there or you just wait for 24 more hours. With the core valve, you end up waiting for 48 hours, and so in U.S. that's a big issue. Yeah. Uh, if the patients go home within two days, then you make money. Uh, if they go home anything after that, then you are actually losing money on them. So that's why there is, I think, 60, 40, or even less uh, for core valve. It's more than 60% is Sapiens market, 65. I think. Dr. Asad, till we connect uh, this uh, next uh, presentation, uh, uh, looking at the aorta, aortic uh, angle in previous case, hmm. uh, it seems to be quite a bit horizontal yes. aorta. So horizontal aortas are actually very good for Sapien. It's a, so, it's a, sapien, yes. you can actually rotate the valve, you can actually make it more aligned with the horizontal aorta. Whereas, uh, core valves are harder to do because yeah. they cannot be aligned with the horizontal plane. So, we did one case of horizontal aorta valve in valve, but it was very tricky. Usually, for a horizontal aorta, sapien definitely will be preferred. You can actually align it more. What is your experience? Sir, one have, I have one question core valve in Pakistan. Problem. We yeah. haven't done any, but like, uh, sapien is much quicker. And the best part, oh, as Dr. Tahir Kheli said, uh, is Conway uh, Access. Uh, we were the first commercial site for core valve in U.S. Uh, Mount Sinai. So we did 60% core valves, and uh, we were talking to, I was talking to Professor Noman the other day that uh, he has done a few cases in U.S. Uh, where patients who had core valve came back in with the STEMI, and it's not very easy. Yeah. Now we have these, uh, Dr. Gilbert Tang is going to talk about this commercial alignment and stuff that you can sort of predict where the left corneostium is, so you try to uh, avoid putting the major uh, part of the valve in front of it. Like in, uh, for most part, especially in sites where, uh, at sites where who do not do towers, it's a nightmare. If they have to get into an occluded left cornea artery, you can probably uh, miss the boat while you're trying to do it. So definitely in a younger population, patients who have already got corneary disease, sapien is preferred. So the, can you hear me? There is one question about the stroke. How do you, is there any uh, incidence of stroke related with this procedure? So, and any uh, prevention about that? In all trials, ranging from super high risk or, uh, sure, uh, or uh, risk patients down to simple uh, or low risk uh, cohort, uh, both core valve and sapien has a very good randomized data. In only intermediate risk patients with sapien, you had slightly higher risk of stroke with a tower versus sever, whereas in all other trials you have low risk of uh, stroke with tower versus sever. So it's just one trial which gives this signal. The rest of them are all low risk with uh, tower. 
Thank you. Uh, exactly. So it's a very valid point by Professor Noman regarding cerebral protection devices. So there are multiple devices that are being trialed. The only one which is FDA approved is the Sentinel device where you put these filters up into the carotids. And uh, unfortunately, it did not show any uh, MRI-based differences, but what they saw was clinically patients who had Sentinel device put in to protect their carotids, clinically they had lesser stroke. However, MRI-based data was similar. Thank you. So cusp overlap and commercial alignment, uh, both two different things. Cusp overlap is that what uh, Dr. Tahir Kheli showed, uh, when you're trying to deploy the valve fluoroscopically, obviously previously we used to use TOE and things like that to align your valve. Now we just you go fluoroscopy. So uh, what initially when we started doing TAVRs, what we thought is just how we see it on echo, that the place where you see the three corny scientists, that is the widest part and that is what you should think of your, uh, as the annular plane. That's where the annulus is. That's where the attachment of the leaflets are. Uh, what we have since seen on CT data is that actually when you correlate the point where you have the maximum annular size, that does not correspond to the site of echo where you see all three sinuses. So on echo, basically TOE, where you see one and a half sinuses, that is where you see uh, if you correspond that angle to your CT data, that's exactly where your annular plane is. So now we have started doing it fluorosco fluoroscopically, that rather than aligning all three annulus yeah, at the is. sinuses at the same uh, line, you just align the non cornicus So we know that on CT... I can hear it. Okay, let me do it. Uh, uh, right cornicus is the lowest point. So if you align your right and left together, and non cornicus on the other side, that means you will be slightly higher than the actual bottom of the annular plane because you're not aligning your valve according to your right cornicus. So in the traditional annular view where he showed the three uh, sinuses together, you have the middle sinus is actually your right cornic sinus. So as long as you're below it, that means you're below the annular plane because that is the lowest sinus. Yeah. Whereas in the you have to go I have a slide record. the right and left together and you are okay, guys, can uh, you hear me? deploying the valve according to the non -conicus. Yes, we can. Thank so you. So you're yeah. essentially okay. ending up. So this is a really interesting case. I'm going to run through this really quickly. Uh, just tell them to come off the um, uh, plural. Um, so Dr. Naveed Ahmed, who is a uh, uh, national uh, uh, graduate from 91, Dr. Heather Ali, who is a K-2005, uh, Bilal Saeed, K-2004. Uh, um, they're all uh, our partners. Uh, Bilal and Heather have been uh, recent induction, uh, but uh, they've trained with us for a long time and, and, and uh, been here now two, three, uh, four, five years. Naveed has been with us for uh, almost 20 years. So. Um, this is an 80-year-old um, gentleman, uh, had a cabbage in 2018. Wayne Graf to OM and RCA are now included. They had stents and stuff. Lima is the only patent one. EF is about 40%. Um, um, this says 60% here, but as we look at it a little bit more, it's 40 to 45. Um, had a, a stent in the left main um, um, <clears throat> on um, April um, uh, 20. Um, and it was a 2.5 by 33 millimeter going into the uh, circumflex, said DES, and then in 2019 has had right coronary artery stents. Um, Carter Snow says really bad uh, peripheral arterial disease. He is end stage renal disease on dialysis. Anemia, AFib, um, has had, during his cabbage, had that uh, left atrial appendage clip. Um, bad creatinine, and obviously, so, um, <clears throat> These are images. The Lima you can see is patent. And um, we're going to show you the rest of the images really quickly here. There's coronary workup. This is the uh, legs. So you can see the right and left leg both have bad disease. So our plan was to, uh, so it's this is a patient that came from outside. So we did not have much information. Uh, but here is what has been done. Can you uh, share this uh, floral on there? Um, or this we get in can you guys see this yeah we see this what i'm saying is we have only 10 to 15 minutes we have to move Shoot, can on you to see the next this case. okay so 
again, both uh, there's a right common femoral artery stent, so we only could go from the left. The left has an iliac stent, so we got in here and we're trying to push uh, this um, impella sheath, which is a 14 French, 18 OD. You can see the whole um, whole whole aorta is calcified, it's torsely in aorta, and the whole thing is moving. And then it's stuck in the stand. Um, so, um, and this is the EF in the meanwhile, could not get the impella up, um, so came back, ballooned it, still couldn't get it up, ballooned it again with 10, um, and changed out for Lundquist wire, and finally was able to get it all up, all the way up. Um, so this is impella going in. The impella is in place. You can see the left atrial appendage clip there. And this right here in the left main is a big calcified area, which we were not sure if it's if it's uh, calcified or if it's instant restenosis, since that had not been put in here. Um, <clears throat> and so now I'll go in there and have uh, Dr. Naveed and um, uh, Heather kind of talk through this um, and show you the IVIS and, um, um, and OCT pictures and see what they're doing. Naveed, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear us? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so why don't you, 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 why don't you take over? Okay. We don't have too much time. It's only 10 minutes, so go up there and show them. <clears throat> I cannot. I cannot hear you. They can't hear us. Can you hear them? Are you guys hearing us? Yes, we can. Thank you. We can hear you. And oh, you can. can. Okay. So, uh, what we did was Yes. So this is uh, OCT. OCT three. Uh, this is the. This is not. The, I need the first one. That's a pre OCT run. that we did, uh, you can see it's uh, from the circumflex coming to the left main. And there's a previously placed stent that you can see with the uh, neoarthrosclerosis inside the uh, stent of a previously placed circumflex stent. This is a 2 5 stent. This is an OM that joined at uh, 3 o'clock. And uh, this is another vessel, which is the ramus coming in at two o'clock, and now we're in the left main. And here, to go forward, right at seven o'clock, you can see, uh, we were debating whether this is a red thrombus uh, versus a calcified nodule uh, right there at seven o'clock. But you can clearly see the stent is uh, underdeployed. It's a three five vessel, and uh, it's a two five stent in there. So we also did the uh, IVUS. Let's see the IVUS. We can just uh, look over here on the screen. Oh. You can play some of this. Can you play IVUS 1? IVUS 1? So that's the. Yeah, yeah. Jay, you have to get closer a little. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, 
I think uh, uh, laser is not going to work here because laser is not uh, the best modality for calcification. <laughs> I think rotablator would be the best approach because laser is uh, usually good for crossing uh, the uncrossable lesions and uh, there is serious calcium here and that would require some form of debulking. Yeah, so so that's so this the, the reason why this was an interesting case is that we uh, th these pictures didn't show it as well, um, but there's a large uh, looks like a, a semi lucent area in the in the ostium and proximal left main, and so the question was if that is instant, then we would use the laser, and so we have that available the, here. But if no... it was outside the stent and it was very calcified then the laser is not going to work very well. So the then the thought was to do a rotational atherectomy. The, the, um, the calcium is in the left vein and uh, it is not inside the stent. And, that's exactly uh, right. Uh, that's so, exactly. You, you picked so, that up very well. So, 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 so definitely, um, I, I would actually use a bigger bird at the start. I wouldn't use a one point, even 1.25, 1.5 bird because the calcium nodules are one kind of calcium where you got to use the biggest uh, possible bird. Like even I will start with a 1.75, go up to two, and uh, that would be really good because. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 okay, let me let me add. So a couple of things. I I agree with you, but there's there's a little caveat to it. Number one is the calcified nodules. We would use a bigger bar, but you've got a stent sitting right outside it. So wherever, uh, whenever we finish, we'll be going into the stent. So I'm a little reluctant in going to a 2.0 to start with. So we actually use the 1.75. If there wasn't that big uh, a calcified nodule, we might just have done a 1.5 and modified the lesion and that this. But because of that, we did that. Um, and we'll show you the uh, pictures of Go ahead. And we also look at the IBIS images. The wire bias was towards the calcified nodules. The wire was for sure. I think, uh, I mean, the calcified nodule is a, is, a, is a type of eccentric calcium rather than uh, concentric calcium. So I think, uh, I mean, the only modality which has shown to work is, is, is rotational atherectomy. And yes. other, other calcium modification strategies such as orbital or IVL, which we use quite a lot uh, in, 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 in Newcastle. And uh, I mean, obviously we use a rotavulator as well. And uh, uh, the, the problem with the instant laser is, it uh, ha any trial with the laser has failed to show any debulking uh, efficacy of laser, to be honest with you. But it's a good strategy if you want to go through a lesion which is uncrossable with the balloon. But here you did absolutely right thing using a biggest, uh, a bigger rotablator bar, 1.75, and uh, I think uh, upfront strategy that is very feasible and very useful. So, uh, so this is the 175 bar is done here now. Would you like to retake the pictures of Ivis to see the effect? Yes, we're, we're going to. We are not done yet. We're going to uh, do Ivis again and OCT here for you. Yes. Um, why don't we set that up? OCT. 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 Okay. okay. We'll show you the repeat OCT that they've done. I guess things. we took a longer time. So. Uh, why did you come over here and take a picture here? So, you got it? so um, on the top, you can see uh, the images. On, on, on the lower area, you can uh, see the stent being deployed there. And then in the middle, you can see the uh, expansion is 94%. But as we come proximally, you 
there's a little under expansion there. Uh, the size of that uh, artery. Can I, uh, can I point? Can I point another thing? There is a stent yes, fracture. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, please do. Yeah, there is a stent fracture where your cursor is. If you go down a little bit, there is a gap over there, and that is possibility of stent fracture. Now the question is: This is a two point five stents. How how much can you expand this stent? This is also a question. Well, I think at this point it doesn't matter because we rotobladed it. We probably caused a little stent fracture, as you're seeing, and so we will balloon it and put a a, a coral stent in there. Yeah, um, that's a good. And, yeah, that's fine. So and then, uh, then last um, five minutes. I kind of see. The, obviously, we've got non-compliant balloons, and we'll go up. By the way, we uh, the coronary IVL just got approved. Uh, we've done peripheral. I haven't yet done a coronary one myself. We've just uh, finished the contract. Uh, and hopefully we will have access to it. You guys in Newcastle have been using it a long, uh, yeah, lot I think, longer uh, than we have. We, no, we just so, reported. Um, uh, you just reported our biggest experience, and that was purely imaging guided. And uh, I think uh, the advantage of uh, IVL and imaging, I, I just touched this morning, was that obviously a you can uh, appreciate the cracks after you have after you have done the IVL, but. In at least 30% of the cases, I found that uh, rotatripsy, I call it, rather than rota shock, is, uh, is necessary, to be honest with you, you know. And this lesion right. could have been ideal for IVL as well, Tahir. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah. Okay, so we're now going to do an IVIS run. Uh, we did the OCT. We're going to do an IVIS run just for the heck of it. I, uh, we normally wouldn't, but we're doing a light case, and we wanted to uh, kind of uh, show everyone what, what all this is. While they're doing this, I will uh, just circle around the cat lab. Um, just this is Brad here, Dr. Naveed Ahmed, Eddie, Tina, Dr. Said here, Dr. Heather Ali here, Tim Kostelecki, our nurse. We've got Dr. Shet back there, who's anesthesia. This is an impella case, and these sometimes are three, four hour long cases. So we've gone to having conscious sedation uh, done by anesthesia. They, some, what we've had in the past is, is we will have the patients just move around and sometimes come off the table, hurt and all that. So this is a lot more controlled situation. And obviously today I was not going to have him move around too much. So Dr. Shed is here helping us out with that. Um, outside, there's a whole lot of slew of people sitting. Could you turn around, show what's going on outside? Um, our IT department back there, outside, control room. And you have, you have a great team doing a great job. Thank okay. You. All right, so we're going to show you the IVIS run now. Um, let you go outside. Let's take a look at the IVIS. <clears throat> we will have to leave you because we, we are uh, we're, the we're uh, at the Heart Hospital, uh, Oklahoma Heart Hospital. We're physician owned, and we have about 50 interventional cardiologists. 12 of us are from Pakistan, so um, sort of a. Um, 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 Dr. Tahir Kelly, I think we'll have to leave you now. Pakistani cardiologists, as they say. Very nice. Um, Dr. Tahir Kheli, uh, thank you very much. And I you got the best IVA you you uh, system as well. We have to start the other case. So the IVIS, obviously, you saw is embedded, so we can uh, see it on our monitor. We've now stepped outside, so we can look at it a little more carefully. Sorry, Dr. Tahir Kheli, can you hear us? get stuck there. You can just do a manual pullback or stuck. Oh, there it starts, starts right there. Yeah. Okay. So there the stent um, looks reasonably well deployed. Yes, still have, there's uh, still quite a bit of uh, new atherosclerosis at uh, some sections. Absolutely, section. absolutely. Yeah. And here you can, you can see that, right? Here, the stent is reasonably well expanded. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. And here, at the so this is, is the new stent that we put in. That's, that's fully expanded. That's a very yes. good result. So this is the new stent that they put in. Uh, which yeah. stent, what stent did we put in? Uh, resolute Medtronic. Naim, can you hear us, please? This was a 3.5 by 12, and they put in a 4.0 non-compliant balloon after Bashir that. barely. I think this is, this is a very good expansion of your stand, Tahir. 
Thank you, thank you. Well, this is, uh, uh, while I was doing Tavern, these guys got done. I just helped them to get the impella in, which was getting a little difficult. <laughs> but uh, we got great interventional cardiologists here. Uh, Navid, so the, uh, the, uh, the size looks pretty good. Yeah. Anything special? No, we were thinking that before uh, the IVAS, that if you want to uh, post dilate it with a forward non compliant balloon, especially the ostium, but it looks like the position of the stent is really good. Very good. And probably there is no need to do any Right. So we'll uh, we'll take uh, the impeller out and uh, can, let's take a, another picture of the floral and uh, can you go on uh, 30 frames per second and give me uh, 512 so we, we can look at it very well. I'll do that. Right. How are the hemodynamics, the pressures and oh, yeah. the Oh, uh, we should show you the impeller. I'm sorry. Um, all right. Let's, let's take a look at the impeller there. <clears throat> So um, on the up there, you're seeing uh, the, uh, the blood pressure that the impella is getting, which is the AO blood pressure, and then the next is LV pressure. That is a, a pressure that is uh, it's not an exact pressure. It's uh, obviously the diastolic pressure is presumed pressure, um, and uh, and then down there you're seeing the motor current, and you're looking at the um, waveform which is very very good down here is 3.3 liters 3.4 liters is the blood flow that it is generating um and uh, overall looks good would you go to t2 and stuff and show them how that works so this is auto at nine but there's different kinds of levels that we have from p9 to p2 p3 um and depends on how much suction and how much uh, um, cardiac output we want to do and then we've got it at uh, uh, at uh, um, um, Auto right now. You saw the single axis earlier that we showed you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take the final picture. Let's show you that, and then we can have further discussion about it. Um, you got 512. Give me 30 frames. All right. So let's just collimator that and take a look at it really carefully. What percentage of your cases you use Impala in the left wing? So, um, you know, Impala is... is, is I'm sorry. Uh, so Im Impala um, is not easy, and it, it really... Uh, we, there I'm was an issue in CCS. Yeah, so sorry? Can you hear me? Uh, it's okay. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but you can't hear so uh, um, we, um, in the first six months uh, for this year, have put in about 30 impellas here. Obviously, remember, we do all, almost 2,500 uh, uh, interventions here, about 27, 2,800 interventions at North. Um, North actually had less than 10 uh, impellas put in. So it's not, uh, it's not something we do every day, um, but it's done in high-risk PCIs or cardiogenic shocks and stuff and all that. So. Um, um, right. Uh, Tahir, uh, thank you so much because we have uh, running out and the, we have our next case is ready, live case. Yes, sir. Yes, so it thank was you. really a great case you showed us. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sorry for some of the, you, uh, all of the team. IT and, uh, we see you shortly. Thank, thank uh, you. They have to move on. Uh, we can do that. All right. Thank you, guys. So, uh, and this is the live case that I've just introduced. Now, can you ask Mohanad if he can come online, if he can hear us? Right, so I think they can uh, switch to the cath lab if uh, the time is there. So, uh, hello, Mohanad, can you hear us? Because... This is Dr. Nadeem Rizvi with the rest of the panel in, uh, from Karachi. Uh, can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, hello, can you hear us? Mohanad, can you fix the focus the camera on your uh, on you because we are just seeing something on the table or something like. So, can you please okay. uh, focus your camera properly? Thank you. No, I, I think we can Not see then. we can see the no, live no, case. Okay. It's yeah, right. about the yeah. camera. Yes, I think. that's fine. That's fine. Right. Okay. Mon thank you. Thank you. Uh, Monad, is it? Monad, can you hear us? I've just introduced you, and I've uh, just introduced Freeman Hospital, Newcastle. There's a panel here consisting of uh, Dr. Asad Khan from Shifa Hospital in Islamabad. There is Dr. Javed Sayal, professor at NICVD, Dr. 
Noman Nasir from uh, uh, Bahria, Dr. Amir Bandesha and Dr. Ambar Ashraf. In addition, there are stalwarts sitting here, Sohail Aziz, Nadir, Asim, and I can see Tahir Sagir, Bashir Hanif is here. So there's quite a good attendance. Can you just introduce the case now? Hi, good afternoon and uh, welcome to Newcastle again. And many thanks for the opportunity to guys present to you. And uh, unfortunately, we can't be in person, but hopefully we could show you a nice case this afternoon. Um, we have a, a lady who is 69 years old who had a, a myocardial infarction, inferior myocardial infarction, four weeks ago. And she had a primary angioplasty to her right coronary artery. And then uh, looking at the left coronary system, she had severe left main stem extending into the LAD and to the circumflex with heavy calcification and a kind of aneurysmal dilatation at the bifurcation of a, a medium-sized diagonal. She originally was referred for, for coronary bypass operation, but she was given the option of undergoing a by, um, bypass or having an angioplasty, and because of her acute MI and because of, she elected to go for an angioplasty, and uh, we, re, we admitted her today uh, for this. Um, Kind of, there were two cases that we were going to go for, but this was the second case that we're going to be showing you today. So, if we go to the first angiogram, let's go forward. Can you see my angiogram? Yes, yes we can, can see forward? you. It's a still image now. Yeah, so we had a little bit of spasm in the radial artery, so we used the bat. We managed to deliver a seven French. So, this is the first uh, PA codal. You could see the severe disease and the calcium even before taking any injection. Is that clear over there, yeah? Yes, yes. Okay, next. And next. Next. And again. Okay, go back one. Okay, so this is the angiogram and this is the case, so I just wonder what comments you have and how would people approach this? Right, Asad, we uh, so, lost the panel. So Incidentally, okay. the echocardiogram showed the left ventricle to be, gonna... to be only mildly impaired, 52% ejection fraction. So I, very... I think we have three issues here. One is that he has got left main and bifurcation disease and we can see the calcium, a lot of calcium. And there is some small aneurysm also I can see at the bifurcation. Go back. So these are the things that we, the, uh, there are critical lesions with uh, bifurcation lesion with some aneurysm and the disease is extensive starting from the left main into the, uh, to the, uh, just short of mid -LED. I think it's quite complex disease and is calcific so I think we need to prepare the lesion and then decide uh, about main stem and the bifurcation. Thank and you, how would you prepare can the lesion? We, can What's I ask approach? the panelists here what uh, about their comments? Asad, Dr. Uh, Asad? Uh, so I think I agree with Professor Afsar as a very complex calcified bifurcation left main disease. And then the challenge here is going to be wiring that LAD. So probably uh, rather than a workhorse wire, I might use a floppy uh, wire with a microcatheter to swap uh, into the rota wire and then uh, take it from there. Probably use a smaller burr. Uh, my decision is biased based on what I see on the table, so it, it looks like Rota Pro is already open. So and I'm going to say he's probably going to Rota this and then uh, rather than using laser or anything else. I don't think you can deliver an IVL uh, balloon into this lesion. Uh, so Rota is probably going to be my choice as well. Okay, Dr. Javed Seyal, any comments? Uh, totally agree with the plan uh, which has been uh, discussed by Dr. Asad and uh, Afsar Raza. But uh, my concern is that patient has a hazy shaft of left main as well. Probably you have to uh, come up to left main or uh, at least you have to cover that uh, shaft of left main also because it seems to be quite hazy and might be a significant eccentric lesion there. Okay, Mohanad, can you just tell us what your plan is, then we can ask the rest of the panel for their comments. Sure, I mean, absolutely. This is what, because you can see heavy calcification, severe disease, extending from the left main, and incidentally, as mentioned just a little earlier, the left main is significant. You could see it in the other views, but even here you could see how eccentric and the much, how much calcium is in this uh, left main. 
Um, so yes, throat ablation was my choice for this because the IVL is going to be very difficult to deliver. Laser with heavy calcium may not be the best option. It does work, but uh, on occasion, particularly with these, um, uh, with these kind of cases, it's not probably the best option. Uh, so rot ablation is, is the choice here. Um, for me, uh, usually with particular cases like this, severe stenosis and the aneurysm, I would start with a small burr first. But of course, it's not going to be the end because the small burr might not do the job completely. But it'll help me to, to upsize, and this is what I did because we've been waiting a little bit. So we took a 1.25 burr. We exactly did the same. We wired the LED using a, a hydrophilic wire and microcatheter in exchange for an extra support rotor wire. Now, extra support rotor wire is probably 98% of my cases I use that. Can we see the helps. images? Can we see those images? Yes, where let's you go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Next. Next. Let's just slowly go back. Go back. So the, the wire went to the circumflex nicely. It was a little difficult to go to the LED because I expected that to be the case, particularly at the exit of the aneurysm. Next. So we managed to wire when, and put, uh, try to deliver at IVUS. But obviously, as we said before, this morning, the Washington test has failed. The IVUS would not advance except about millimeter from the, from the left main. Next. And now we exchange for the rotor wire. And that's an excess support rotor wire. This is a 1.225 bar. Next. Mohamed, did you change so this is the, over the so which micro, micro which micro catheter did you use to exchange the wire? I use a, a Corsair 135 centimeter because with the calcium and the severe narrowing, it's uh, I don't think any. Quite often, I'll use an over the wire balloon if I think I could deliver the over the wire balloon. Just cost saving, I suppose, instead of paying 310 pounds, you pay 40 pounds for the balloon. But in case like this, I think there's no, no chance of, of the balloon going, and there's no point of trying. So I went straight for a Corsair. Um, after the Corsair, I said the extra support. This is a 125. One, uh, one question about the LED just proximal to the aneurysm. I can see there is some eccentric lesion. Do you have yes. any fear of using a big bar because you see because of perforation or anything, or you? Uh, not necessarily, but this is what I said about you have to approach this very carefully and gently um, and uh, stepwise approach usually avoid any problems. The problem here, the, my main concern was about the aneurysm rather than, than the, uh, the proximal LED. And this is why one of the reasons also the excess support wire would be much, much more helpful. Because if you have the floppy wire close to the aneurysm and you have any little resistance, when you push on the, on the burr, the wire could easily kink and the burr will follow it and cause a perforation. Right. So the excess support through the wire will be much easier. Here I did the left main first and then this is the polishing run. Next. You can see the burr went slowly or nicely. Next one. Monad, just a, a yeah. provocative scene, scenario and a question. What if it's a mm. large, uh, large diagonal that you needed to protect, although I know the rota favors non-occlusion of uh, side branches, but what would be your strategy if it was a very large diagonal? Uh, and how do you protect those? Or do you just, you know, rota, or do you use some other technique to protect the diagonals? Because you obviously well, do to, not wire. No, I didn't protect it because I don't think you need to. Um, and this is the same with the circumflex. And that's something I was going to talk about when you're treating left main stem um, rotablation. Because you need to rotablate the, the LED. Yes, stop that, please. You need to rotablate the LED and you do it in a controlled manner. You avoid dissection, you avoid any problem. So you could move your rotor wire after you perform the rotor and the LED and put it in the circumflex and rotablate the circumflex without any problem. If you do have a problem with the LED, before I move on to do the circumflex, I would stand almost very close to the left main. I would leave about five millimeter of the proximal LED. So if I take my wire, I'm not going to run into any trouble. Um, and then I could rotablate the circumflex. The same thing with the diagonal here. I did look at it. It is a medium-sized diagonal. It does have disease in it. I don't think it's going to be detrimental. And I think we just uh, concentrate on the LED. So next one. Again. So just stepwise approach here. And we rotablated with 1.25. Next. This is the result after the 1.25, next. Then we took a 1.75 here. 
I was going to take a 2 because the left lane is quite huge. But again, we rotabulated gently to cover time. This is the polishing run of the left main. Next. You can see this is the, what we call the pecking technique. I see people doing this, and I think that is not, not the way to be doing rotabulation. You approach the lesion, you let the burr work for two, three seconds, and come back. If you notice any drop in the blood pressure or the heart rate, then you could make it much less. If it's, the patient is stable, you could leave the burr at the lesion a little longer. And this is how you could do it without any... Any problem? Next. Monod, why did you not use the 1.25 to go a bit more distally, uh, you know, across the bend? I did. No, I uh, did. All right, okay. Now I did. I'm just kind of just going, yeah, this is the 175 now, going through the whole thing. Next. Again. So there you go. You could see it. This is the polishing run. Again, what you're looking for, once you've done the road tablation, you want to see the burr moving without any resistance and no drop in the, in the uh, rev. So the revs are with 175, you are using what, 140, 150 or higher or lower? 155 usually. Anything, what, the 1.25, 150, I'll use 185, 180, 185. Anything above, I go with 150, 155. In this case, it was 155 for the 175, 175 burr and 185 for the 1.25 burr. So next one. And that's the result after the first, uh, or the rotablation 1.75. Next. Redilatation now, and this is what I said I was going to do in order to make sure that there's no problem with the LED. I think I would have easily taken the, the wire out, and I wouldn't have had any trouble. Rotablated the circuit and rewired both. But uh, I elected just to, to treat this LED at this set area. Next. Did you take pictures, IOS pictures, after this yeah, after uh, the... rota, or...? Well, I have, we tried, we could show you the last one. I'll show you that. Can we Dr. go on Norman, the last run? Any I comments think? from you? You were just... Uh, just uh, uh, when the IVS catheter didn't go in the beginning, sometimes some people use it as a test. If you can get the IVS catheter down, then you should consider taking the IVL catheter down as well, intravascular lithotripsy catheter down. And then the, um, I guess after the 1.25 bar with the aneurysm there, and uh, instead of going into the bigger bar, could you consider a rota tripsy in this case that you've done the 1.24 bar, you've made room, bring the lithotripsy balloon now and use that as a consideration? I, I mean, it all yeah, worked I think out you nicely can. with this, yeah. I think you can. To my mind, I always think about, particularly in places like yours or where IVL is not easily available, I think using the two technology may be needed, but in a very few cases, you end up spending a lot of money. If you're going to do rotablation, you need to do it properly, i.e. size correctly to get it. And for the last many, how many years you've been doing it without much problems. You use a 125 in the big artery and then take the IVL. Yes, it's okay, but it's a, a kind of a, a double cost that is, to me, can be overcome. Although there are probably one to two, three percent cases that you may need both. Uh, but yes, it's a, it's a valid thing. And as we mentioned, the IVS thing is called the, used to be called the Washington test. If the IVAS doesn't go down, then you need to do some debulking. Can we see the IVAS? Can you see the IVAS on the screen? Yes, yes. Please. yes. Can you comment on yes. this? So, yes. Degree so this is, we took the first one at the beginning, tried to put an IVAS down, expecting that to go, and fair enough, it didn't, and I think we damaged the catheter. We had to change it. It was our affinity uh, from Philips, so we changed the eagle eye. And this is after the first run of the IVAS. You can see some cracks in the calcium. Yeah, you can see the crack in the calcium. Now, if but it did not go beyond that little bend. After, because after, obviously the eagle eye has got a bigger tip. After the 1.25 one, 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 one of IVS caution, you, which obviously I the noticed that the there was calcium, a bend. Would you have still pushed for the going by the higher size burr? Yes. The, and that's what I did. I mean, I took the 175 because I didn't think the 125 in here. This is, again, this is the message I want the audience and everybody who's particularly new in the rotablation. Putting a 125 burr in a big artery, you feel like you've done the rotablation. The yeah, the volume. We can't hear him. Uh, Monad, your volume has... We lost your volume. Oh, sorry. Your voice. Yes, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, that's fine. Okay, so I was talking about rotablation. If you want to do rotablation, really it has to be done in a, in a correct way. Taking a 1.25 burr 
into a 4 artery and thinking we've done rotor ablation is not enough. The burr will go up and down, but probably hasn't done much. I mean, I, I guess the idea is you modify the, the plaque. Do you want to debulk it? If you have cracked the superficial calcium, probably you'll be most likely yeah, sure. able to stretch the stem. So why debulk so, it if you have uh, done the plaque absolutely. modification? That, that yeah, is the argument that you hear all the time. But yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, I published a series myself, and 28% of people had later problem within uh, three years. So anyway, I, I, didn't, I don't believe in the only modification in all cases. There are cases where you have to upgrade. I think that's the usual arguments that very Next. experienced operators use high, so when they start using 1.75, lesser experience, they feel that <laughs> plaque modification is enough and the results are pretty good. Pretty good. I mean, I mean in Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah. 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 But, that's but absolutely question, true. Question, but you have to change, change, change the bigger, 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 Question the right two here. points first of all. There's echo. Uh, echo. Uh, uh, question is here that uh, then what should be the limit? As this artery is about 3.5 or 4, oh, whether whether we should go for 2 or 2 point. Monad, the question is very relevant and it's, it is a mechanistic thing that if the artery is yeah. let's say 3.5 or 4, then what's yeah. the difference? You are still with a 2 bar, you are modifying it. You are not actually ablating the media up to the media, you are still modifying, so what, what's the harm sure. in just cracking it, looking at it at IVAS and if your balloon dilates fully, then just don't use a higher burr. So that's the argument that Dr. Javed Seal has just put up. Yeah, I mean that, that is an argument, but then you're taking the chance of putting a balloon going to high pressure and it, it, sometimes I do that, I don't say that I don't do it all the time, it's just, I think as you build the experience you know which art is going to respond, which is not. Um, and based on the size of the RT, particularly in this case and this big left. Javed, you are very quiet, Dr. Javed from UK. I, uh, what's your sure. take on this? Uh, just a couple of things. First of all, I think uh, I noticed uh, there was uh, a bit of uh, uh, something like close to about 70% uh, stenosis distal to the aneurysm, Hanid, and there was a bend. It is just for the education for uh, people who are starting the rotor later that uh, a that would you be were you worried at some point that uh, that bend could obviously could cause problems in terms of uh, uh, bur going into the wall of the artery. That's number one, and number two is that uh, none of the trials have shown. This is in relation to the previous question that uh, whether you do debulking or whether you just uh, crack the calcium is not translated into any improved outcome on any atherectomy strategies, whether it is uh, uh, rotational atherectomy, whether it's orbital atherectomy. So why not to just stick to a single bar, which is 1.5, and just uh, uh, facilitate the passage of the stent? Because there have been no data so far, which has shown any improvement in outcomes by doing a rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy or laser or anything like that. Well, Javed, the, the study you're talking about are more than 30, 40 years ago. Even now. Um, and, and there, you know, it, it is, if that is what, to my mind, I need to prepare the lesion. Well, it's not only about delivering the stent. It's about making sure that's the best outcome when you deploy the stent. Because if it is under-expanded or under-deployed, there's always a recipe for a problem later on. So, you know, uh, this is, I think, preparing the lesion well is the, the, more, or the most important uh, part. So this is what we did anyway, and let's go forward. So now we came pre-dilated, and now, as I said, I will stand the proximal LED and leave a very uh, short area so I could take my wire out without any worry. Next. Next. This is the stand going in. Next. And we just deployed it. We'll post dilate it a little later. Next. <coughs> Next. And this was the circumflex. Now I'm on it. And I'm about to rotablate the circumflex with 1.25. And just to show you, the, we were using a rotor pro. So I'm going to set the speed to 185. So you've left around uh, 2 to 3, 5 millimeters stop, of stop osteal LED, which you're going to fix later. Yeah, because, just one second. This is because, as I said, if there's any dissection or any problem, if you take your wire, you could lose your artery. In this case, there wasn't, but it is still, I thought it's better if we stent it and just leave a very small area of the artery and cover so you could come back and wire it later without worrying about losing it. Now, we're just going to set this at 185. Go on. Up. 
I'm sorry, does it look, uh, the, uh, the artery looks smaller now? Or, or originally also it was, I mean, is it worth doing a rota in this size artery? This is this artery is at least a three millimeter. Is, uh, when we put the, the course, it was quite resistant to go down because there's a big, a big chunk of calcium proximally. Um, and uh, even the, you know, the ST change when we put the, the course, it was completely occlusive. I think it does look, it's a little underfilled. Approximately, there's a huge, uh, um, a huge uh, uh, stenosis and calcium. So basically, taking the rota, I, I thought I'd show you this. Obviously, the rota, bro, you have lost the foot pedal. So basically, everything from here controlled by the hand. Can we see the rota, bro, Martin? Can we put it on the table, please? Okay, Monad, I think we'll have to wrap up it? in five minutes because... Uh, oh, five minutes, okay, I'll just show you, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, we'll just sure. go, go to, okay, Dyna Glide. Okay, just one second. This Let's is see. your Rota Pro. Yeah, this is the Rota Pro. Now I said we... Okay, now Dyna Glide. I Dyna Glide my burrs up without any problems. Okay, off you go. And I often even don't scream because you don't need to, everything is stable. Monad, they used to say the original teaching eight, ten years back when I started rotablating was that you should not danaglide forward. Yes, that's true. So I use... That, is used to be, that used to be because there was worry about the catheters being, um, or the burr affecting the inside of the catheter, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't happen at all. Um, and in the same token, particularly with the launcher catheter, because the, the sizing of the catheter is important. So the, the, the seven French could take even two over, but the limit is very, very, very tight. The inner diameter of seven French is 2.03 millimeters. So you're only ha working with 0 0.3 of millimeter if you take a two over. Uh, I've will done you, it a few will times. Will you use but same 1.25 or you will use new rota for this SLA? No, this one is, I'm still using a 1.25. I still have it on the table. So I reconnected it and just about to rotate the sir. So you could go back to the, to the image. Again, we're all... So quite often what I'll start for two, maybe 10, 15 seconds to see how the patient will respond. In the LAD, we didn't have any, any uh, bradycardia or hypotension. In the circumflex, it may be different because it's to make sure that you, when you deliver your, you just do dynaglide down the burr, and if it goes by dynagliding. I think if, uh, as a, as a strategy for Pakistan, I think people shy away from rotablation because of various risks. Yeah, that's very true. The more you do it, the less easier it gets. That's why when my teaching the fellows, I try and tell yeah. them that they should get used to not going forward in Dynaglide because otherwise people are not used to over the wire balloons and holding the wires at arm's length, etc. So I think first they learn it the proper way and then they can use the tricks. I don't know if I call it the proper way because I think, I, I mean, any way is, as long as it works. And I've never had any problem. And I do probably close to 60 or 70. 60 yes, or one 70 but I'm talking about fellows. I'm not talking about you. For sure. I mean, <laughs> you, no, no, I know, you but can do whatever teaching, way you what I'm want. The teaching. No, no, you could teach them. I think it is the old way of teaching them. And that's gone out of the window. It's no, not valid anymore. You could dine a glide forward. Or that okay, so then so another very provocative in, uh, thing. Yeah. Once or twice, I have left a plastic wire. Yesterday, I was discussing with Hanif, and everyone was shocked. And I put a plastic wire on the side oh. branch and rotated across it, and nothing happened because I tried nothing it outside. Happened, yeah. And a plastic, yeah. you know, if you want to protect a side branch, what's your comment on that? Putting us putting a plastic jacket wire in the side branch and rotating with a 1.25 across it. Yeah, absolutely fine. It doesn't cause any problem. I know there has been some, uh, some couple, two or three cases now where people have used the, uh, the uh, guide liner. So you yeah, take that's a seven for French going distally, but you see... Uh, no, 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 even for, even for this, you could leave your wire in the side branch, but I think it's quite cumbersome. What you mentioned is absolutely valid and can be done. 
And I have done it on a few occasions where I didn't want to take my side wire out. Um, if you do it with a small burr, it, it doesn't affect. The, as I yeah, said, this is all what we do about, about rotas from the really quite from the region about 30, 40 years ago. Still valid, the majority of it, but I think you could, you could put a second wire if you have to. Because the whole theory about rota burr is that it will not ablate a smooth surface. So if you've got a yes. smooth surface, it will not damage you. So if it's a plastic it's jacket, the differential, wire, properly put yeah, it, nothing It's the differential it. cutting. But Mohaned, the differential not, cutting that, Mohaned, uh, you can do, uh, in maybe in your hands, but it's not the traditional teaching and it should not yes. be done as a routine because, again, most of but the time, which one happens, should, if something happens, then uh, you will be in trouble. Sure, which one? I'm not, which one should not be done as a routine? Yeah, I know. I, I think the argument the is that we always go with a, yesterday the gentleman went with a 20 atmosphere on a cutting balloon. Every day we are going above rated burst. So, you know, there are various things that we do which are not really guidelines. So, but I think overall for well, teaching, you know I agree with Bashir that we should not teach our fellows to do this. A very experienced people in exceptional cases can, can do what they like. But as a teaching, one should and stick uh, to the tree. Uh, you know what I would say to that, uh, Nadeem? I think that's absolutely correct. However, it's one of these, I always say that to the fellow also. Sometimes you could do anything you want, whether it's, and you get away with it. And that's the problem. If you get away with it, you start thinking it's okay. And it's the same as when you close your eyes and cross the road. You could cross the road 10 times with your eyes closed, nothing happens. On the 11th time, you're going to be hit and hit hard. So really it's about That's the correct. principle of what you're doing and following the rules and making sure that what you <laughs> are Javid. doing makes sense and it's a, okay, and physiologically counter, correct. Counter argument to that argument that basically we are putting a wire in a side branch to protect during uh, stain deployment. Uh, uh, during rota we don't have chance to occlude that side vessel. So that, that uh, No, I mean that is theoretically right but it's not 100% correct that if you rota across a uh, large side branch in a calcified, you cannot say in 100 out of 100 cases it will not obstruct. I mean, that it will, if you, you know, uh, usually it doesn't, but sometimes it can. And if it does, if a calcium plaque ruptures and goes and includes it, uh, a sub large side branch, then you've had it. Because now you've got to go in an angled way into a calcium plaque on an so osteum of a side branch. I, I'm not sure if the differential cutting concept applies to a hard surface wire. It's smooth though, but you know, it's still uneven with the vessel wall. I mean, yeah. you could still uh, shave off some of the vessel mm, uh, wire. Yes. Uh, yes, and then the okay, Monad, thank you very much. I think we are running out of time. And that's an excellent demonstration. And uh, so just tell us uh, briefly, very quickly, what's your final strategy? Are you going to now do a DK crush on the, on the left main? Uh, probably not. I'm going to do probably a reverse T here. Reverse so I'm going to stand the, uh, yes, I'll stand the left main, then I go through and just put the stand uh, in the osseous circumflex. Uh, I'm going to ivus it now because to see how bad is the ivus, uh, the ostium. If the ostium is okay, I might not even touch it, do anything with it. Um, but if it does need doing, it's just because the size discrepancy. You could do a DK crush, but I think this lady has been on the table so for a while. So you're going to do a reverse T and just like a cone, you're going to leave it, uh, do a tap or, a, or you are going to do an actual T because the angle is not really 90 degrees, it's still less than that. So you will... Uh, it, is, you'll it is actually 90 degree. If you see it in, the, in this view, there's a lot of overlap. We took a few degrees that didn't, a few an, uh, angiograms. The cranial view is the one that shows you uh, this the best. And I think the reverse T, um, because you have the stent in the left main, you could see it on the angiogram and you could see where to put your stent in the osseum, so you know we've covered the whole thing. But DK crush is not a very good option too because that's, uh, that will accommodate for the size discrepancy. And I think it's a smaller, kind of a smaller OM distribution is not big. There is a distal disease as well, so I don't know where, if you're going to put a stent, where are you going to put it? Yeah. I think it's going to be a high threshold for me to put a stent in there, to be honest. So I think I just need to see the ostium, so I don't want to compromise it. Or like, because it is sizable, my cardium supplied by that, despite the size, small size. I'm just giving some nitrate and take a picture and see what, what we've got, then we decide. Okay, I think in, in the interest of time, I'd like to just thank the panelists, Dr. Afsar Raza, Dr. Javed Ahmed, it's been a pleasure having you here. 
and I think we like we are looking forward to seeing you tomorrow again. And like to thank all the panelists. And I think uh, we are all going to cruise dinner, and we are all invited.